And it's my great pleasure to open the first session, the Developing Secure App session of today, and to welcome Nikolay Elenkov on the stage. If you, I mean, I, I guess most of you in here will already be familiar with the name, and I, I assume that many of you will already have his book standing on the bookshelf. If not, take a look at it because we use that as a standard reference when it comes to getting new students into developing secure apps under Android, or maybe even just diving down into the Android internals themselves. As last time in 2015, please, Nicolay, welcome to the symposium, and we are very much looking forward to your talk. Okay, great. Uh, <clears throat> so, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's such an early time for the IT industry. Uh, thanks for the uh, to the organizer for having me here and organizing a great event again. Uh, so, this talk is um, it has introduction in the title. So, there is nothing groundbreaking here. Nothing particularly new. If you have been involved in Android security, you might know most of the stuff in here. Uh, there are some new things about Android N and how to deal with the changes in there. But uh, basically, we are going to talk about testing applications, mainly uh, static analysis, traffic analysis, getting the app data, and some common vulnerabilities that uh, I see. So uh, this is not in no way meant to be exhaustive. It's not classified. It's not uh, uh, categorized in super uh, <coughs> fine categories, but I think this is the, the at least in, in my line of work, that's uh, most of the vulnerabilities that we see. So it's going to be a very wide and I guess not very deep look into the, into the topic, but at least hop hopefully it will give you some pointers on uh, how to test Android applications. So uh, why I'm talking about this, I work for a company called Lime. I think the icon is this one. You might have seen it, might have not seen it. It's a messenger application. Started in Japan, now it's popular all over Asia. But besides the messenger application, there is a whole bunch of other applications. This is just a sample of them. Like most of the time, there's more than 50 in the, in the Play Store and, of course, the App Store for uh, Apple, uh, games, social applications, also like lately payment and uh, uh, auto, of online to offline business, uh, trying to sell stuff, you name it. So there's a wide range of application and there's always new ones coming up. Like some of them are successful, some of them are not. So if they get uh, basically, especially for games, uh, if they don't achieve whatever metrics they were supposed to achieve, sometimes they uh, get recalled in a matter of months. So we have constantly new apps uh, being produced. And of course, we test them before release. So um, to start with, what is an Android application? I guess everybody knows here it's an APK file, which is basically a zip file. Uh, if you want to do static analysis, what it means, you, uh, you want to look inside the APK in the application, see what, what code is in there, what resources is in there. So uh, usually your first thing you will do is uh, unpack the APK with, if you just want to look at the contents, unzip is sufficient or jar a utility. If you want to actually decode the resources and have a look at the code, APK tool is your friend. It will both decode uh, the money, the resources, it will also disassemble the, <coughs> the bytecode, and uh, you will be able to, to look at uh, the resources and the code. Uh, so, um, Android applications, of course, are mostly written in Java, so they have a classes text file that are recently usually more than one uh, because of some limitation of the format, but um, <coughs> 
Um, the, but the Java code is in classes decks. It, as I said, it will be disassembled by our APK tool or Smiley, so uh, you can look at it. Uh, if you want, you want to get something which is close to the original Java code, you could use uh, a number of tools, um, JADEX or JEB, which uh, is a very nice but expensive tool. <laughs> Uh, which will uh, let you look at something which is very close to the original uh, Java code. You might need to change um, a few things to make it easier to test. We'll have more details about that later. So you might have to change uh, some resource or some, uh, some of the, the code and repack, resign, and install again to test. Uh, of course, Android applications also have native libraries, native code. If you want to look in, in those, you would. Uh, uh, you would uh, need something that can disassemble a uh, native code. Either Pro is an uh, industry standard hopper, also works quite well, and it's only a fraction of the price. So unpacking, how does it look like? You use IBK tool, you have one single file, and as a result uh, of the unpacking, you had a whole bunch of files, resources, code, native libraries, some, in this case, uh, hard-coded, uh, private key, and of course, the manifest file. Uh, if you want to <coughs> change something, and then produce an APK file again, you would use, again, APK tool with the B option to uh, pack the resources into a single file. Of course, uh, to work on Android, you have to sign it, so you will need some uh, sort of key, which can easily be generated. Uh, so jar signer, you can produce a signed APK, and then just install it. Test. So manifest, as you know, is the entry point of uh, Android applications. Pretty much everything about the application is in there. It's very tightly packed. There is a huge amount of information in there. Um, for this is just a small, uh, small example. But in this, like I don't know, maybe 20 lines of code, you have the, the package name, the permissions. In this case, external storage, internet. Uh, you know that backup is enabled, which is quite useful. Uh, we'll talk about it later. And you get the main activity, other activities which are uh, there. Uh, you can also see that it has a service. It's a, you see that it uses Accra. It's an open source project for uh, error reporting. And finally, you can see that it's actually a multi-process stuff. So if you are looking at the processes, you should be <coughs> looking for uh, more than one. So we said a few words about Smuddy. Uh, Mali is um, very uh, similar, I guess, in a way to assembler. Um, it's uh, instructions of the how the, um, <coughs> the Android uh, Java virtual machine. Uh, so, if you use uh, decompiler code, you might uh, tool you might get called something like this. Which this is uh, getting a private key and then doing some encryption with it. So the equivalent of those like two lines of code is all of this. So Smiley is a lot more uh, wordy. But uh, on the other hand, the compilers which produce Java codes are often wrong, sometimes critically wrong. <laughs> so if you want to see something which is uh, really close to the, to the original code, you should definitely uh, be looking at the Smiley code. Another advantage is that, for example, uh, if you have a huge application, you use a tool like JEP. It lets you do cross-referencing and whatnot. It's a very powerful tool, but still, with a huge application, it can be quite slow. Smiley code is just text, so you can use grep or anything to find uh, places of interest very, very quickly, and then drill down in your uh, tool if you, if you need to. Okay, so native code. Native code, of course, it's written usually in C or C++ compiled to native libraries. Uh, it's part of the Android application, it's usually called uh, via Genie from the Java side. Sometimes the whole application could be native code, but there is some still misunderstanding uh, among Java developers that uh, native code is somehow more secure. Sometimes we see that you know the password or key is being 
uh, hard coded or somehow derived in native code and then just they pass it up to the to the Java code because you know uh, and <coughs> still some people uh, consider native code much harder to uh, to to reverse engineer or to look into uh, in practice it's not uh, it's not a particularly effective way to hide your secrets unless you do some extra work. So in this case, of course, it's trivial to find the secret string. If you uh, see what this code is doing, you will find out what they're trying to do with it. Uh, of course, reversing the native code could be tricky. It can be C++, a lot of code, a lot of uh, weird function names. They have, you might have templates, again, more code. Uh, and if they really wanted to hide what they're doing in the native code, you would have uh, at least some amount of optimizations, deleting symbols, or even obfuscation, or even packing, where you have one piece of code which loads another, which loads another, and then etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so this is native code. Depending on the time for application, most things are in Java, but uh, you should definitely. Uh, be wary of any any native libraries. Uh, <coughs> so this is probably going to be the bulk of the talk about uh, dynamic analysis and traffic analysis because uh, for static analysis, you can at least flag most of the potential vulnerabilities with a number of tools, uh, whereas for the dynamic part requires some knowledge of the protocol, some knowledge of what the application is trying to do. So. It's usually something you have to look into manually. Uh, so traffic, <laughs> most application nowadays, they use um, some sort of HTTP or, so usually it's enough to have something like per proxy, child proxy, that can uh, intercept the traffic or uh, decrypt uh, SSL if used. Lately, however, a lot of uh, applications are moving to speedy or HTTP2, which is a binary protocol, still uh, the same uh, same idea as HTTP, but different format. So not terribly well supported by the current tools. Also lately, especially in uh, high traffic applications or even some, some messaging applications, WhatsApp is using their own uh, noise, no, uh, noise pipes for uh, transport encryption. Facebook has their own thing. So some applications are not using sender HTTP protocol, but most of them, maybe 90 in or more percent are HTTP, so this is all you would need. Uh, <coughs> so uh, you have HTTP, usually it's uh, HTTPS, so SSL protected. You need some, some way to look inside the traffic, so you perform man in the middle with uh, perp, etc. Uh, how it works, you install a CS, CA certificate in the user store, and usually the proxy will tell care, take care of the rest. It will dynamically generate a new uh, new server certificate for each host you access that your uh, your device will trust because you have the CA certificate in there. Uh, this doesn't work on Android 7 and later. We'll I'll say a, a bit more about that later. So uh, from around four. You have you can just easily install a certificate uh, without root access, and then seven changes things again. Uh, of course, you can have certificate pinning, uh, which tries to limit the certificate the application trust. So there's you might need to deal with that. Uh, some apps uh, might ignore proxy settings uh, completely, so you we'll, you have to use something like a transparent proxy to, to get the traffic. One way is to use Proxy Droid, which is a, sort of a local transparent proxy, requires root access. Uh, the other is reverse tethering, where you basically pipe all of the traffic through uh, your laptop or uh, your uh, Wi-Fi router and then look into it. So in a bit more detail, uh, okay, so it's, uh, other protocols besides HTTP, sorry. Uh, you can use, of course, Wireshark for lower level protocols, it can decrypt also um, HTTPS, ISSL, if you have the private key for, for in some cases, uh, if for secrecy is disabled. Um, there's multiple plugins you can easily 
uh, write your own. Uh, you can use SOCAT or something similar to pipe HTTP-like protocols to, to burp, like namely SIP is, is usually uh, via UDP, but in, in practice, in, in principle, it's very much like uh, like HTTP, so it can be it can be tested with burp. Uh, you can use TCP dump directly on the device to capture traffic. Why you might want to do this is because some apps behave differently when connected with Wi-Fi and 3G or LTE. It's not very common, but sometimes uh, they consider the 3G network or the LTE network somehow, uh, somewhat more trusted, so they have <coughs> different settings in there uh, for Wi-Fi and 3G or different optimizations. One uh, method that just, which is somewhat underused is the Android VPN. Uh, since Android 4 point something, uh, you can have uh, this application-based VPNs, which basically uh, give you a file descriptor and you can read and write all the packets from there. In, in this case, this is a tool that basically just dumps everything in PCAP file, which can, you can later uh, examine with uh, Wireshark. Uh, so a bit more detail about many in the middle setup uh, in burp you can uh, if you run burp on your PC you can download the certificate from the local host and then push it push it to the device and install it the default is usually called something like port trigger CA you can have your own in this case you can see a geo trust CA some some applications to by checking the name of the issuer, so if it has geo trust, then it's trusted. So there's one way to go around it. Uh, once you have that, you can redirect the traffic, and you will see HTTPS decrypted. In this case, you can see the password and everything. So how to <coughs> redirect the traffic to your proxy? Uh, as I said, reverse tethering is very powerful and easy way. Uh, if you have a MacBook, you can just enable uh, internet sharing and then uh, set up port forwarding, like in this case, anything on port 80 and 443 is being uh, redirected to the burp at the uh, local host. So once you have these rules, you just add an anchor, forwarding anchor, and then apply, and you should be able to see all the traffic going into your uh, local proxy. On <coughs> Linux, It's uh, somewhat more not not straightforward, but basically, if you uh, this is Ubuntu, if you create a hotspot and then use it to share the network, you can then uh, easily use IP tables to uh, redirect the port to the local host, or of course, you can be uh, you can redirect it to a different host if you will. Uh, this okay. One way to do it is just with a laptop, which has uh, both uh, Wi-Fi and uh, Ethernet. Uh, you can use it uh, this method with any any sort of um, Wi-Fi router that you can run code on. Uh, so pinning, as I said, uh, to the, to uh, to restrict the certificate that an application trusts. Usually, by default, it would trust anything that the OS trusts, but some applications do uh, some extra work to uh, limit what they trust. There's a uh, talk about it later. You should definitely hear it in 4D file. But um, there's custom proxying. Yeah. OK. Yeah. OK. Better. Uh, so some. Uh, applications usually have some custom code in there to do the pinning. One way is to have a trust store that contains all the certificates they trust. Another way is to check the hashes of the public keys. Uh, how to disable this? <coughs> usually uh, you can just remove the code if you unpack and repack. If you don't want to do this, you can uh, hook the um, certificate validation uh, methods of the OS. Yeah. So. There is Just Trust Me and SSL and Pinning are popular expose uh, plugins that uh, do this for you. Uh, <coughs> sorry. 
and uh, as I said, in Android 7, it's uh, supported by the OS. So this is Android 7. It has something called declarative security, uh, network security config, which basically allows you to do a lot of uh, <coughs> customization around uh, HTTPS and uh, trusting uh, SSL certificates uh, with uh, just, a, just an XML file. Uh, you can do uh, many things. You can set a debugging CA. You can disallow clear text traffic. You can do pinning in there. Uh, it's a very powerful feature, how it works. Basically, there is a new trust manager and a provider which is initialized from the XML file in, in, in your application. Uh, there is a so-called root trust manager that uh, implements uh, all of this, and it's installed fairly, very early in the activity thread. So when you start an application, one of the first things that it does is install this uh, new uh, trust manager. <coughs> How the code looks basically like this. This is the important part here, that if you have anything less than uh, Android M, uh, it will trust the it will trust the user uh, user store, but if you don't, it won't. So if you are uh, using an application which is uh, which targets Android M or later, even if you install certificates in the user store, it, they won't be trusted. They will be ignored. Uh, this is very uh, very good from a user perspective perspective because. Uh, even if users are tricked into installing some, some rogue certificate, yeah, potential attackers won't be able to uh, capture the traffic, but for our purposes, it's kind of <coughs> a problem. So how to get around this? Um, again, one easy way is to repack the applications and change the target API setting. Another is, is would be to hook the trust manager. Uh, for Android 7, currently Expose doesn't work, but uh, latest Frida, we'll talk about uh, a bit more about Frida and Expose works. So what you want to do is find the root trust manager and basically just override the check server uh, method. You can, you can do something more interesting, like inject your own CA or just disable a certain certificate or simply disable pinning. In this example, it just Overrides it to do nothing, just uh, de debug logging. <coughs> Protocol analysis, is, uh, as I said, Wireshark is good for exploration because some applications uh, they will deliberately use um, obscure ports to run uh, uh, HTTP on port uh, I don't know 9000, or uh, they will even uh, use port 80 for TLS. So. If something is not working correctly in your uh, man-in-the-middle proxy, you want to uh, look at in with Wireshark what exactly is going on. One, once you have uh, traffic flowing in your uh, proxy application, you can do many things. Uh, Burp is especially powerful. If you don't have the pro version, you should definitely, definitely buy it. But uh, you can capture and replay uh, Requests you can match and replace automatically headers, tokens, and, and whatnot. There are many plugins available. This one is one of the very useful one is AES Crypto. It lets you uh, decrypt uh, any traffic, uh, any AES encrypted uh, traffic in case of like tokens or custom custom authentication and whatnot. Another very useful uh, feature of Burp is that it's Java based. So you can write plugins in Java. Why this is useful? Because uh, for uh, binary protocols, such as uh, Protobuf or Thrift or others, uh, you can simply uh, take out the serialization code from the application, put it in your in your plugin, and then decode uh, decode the code inside Burp. For some uh, MIT M proxy in Python, it does something very similar. If you prefer Python, you can use MITM proxy. It might be a bit easier to write, but uh, purpose is definitely my, my tool of, of choice. Okay, so 
backup uh, repeal uh, want to inspect what what the data the application is uh, saving there are different different ways to do that uh, one way is to use the native uh, Android backup feature it's enabled by default or if the developer doesn't do anything special you should be able to get uh, the data with uh, uh, with the standard uh, ADB backup tool without without you don't want, uh, need root access for that uh, the backup is uh, essentially a tar file with a header prepended if it's not encrypted it's very easy just get rid of the header and uh, then you can use open SSL zip to uh, decompress or you can put the gzip header and then just use uh, gzip to unzip it and then because it's a simple tar file you just get the data from there um, in later latest Android versions if you have um, full disk encryption on which is the default for uh, most recent versions uh, you also uh, the backups are encrypted by default so you can you have to uh, you will get an encrypted backup which you can uh, decrypt if you know the password of course uh, this tool is on github basically you just pass the password and you get a star file if you have root you can get the data directly from the device uh, as you might know uh, most of the sandbox data is under data data package name uh, there is also shared data on the SD card or external storage for in later uh, devices it's actually emulated but in SD card is usually a symlink under Android data package name files you have uh, all the all the shared shared data on external storage again you can use just tar or any other tool of your preference to to bundle up the files and then uh, export them to your desktop uh, another way to store data is cloud storage this is sometimes uh, overlooked a very uh, famous example is whatsapp you can back up your chat on ios it uses uh, icloud on uh, android is google drive so you know whatsapp has end-to-end -end encryption but if you turn this on all your messages end up in google drive or icloud so you should definitely have two-factor verification on if you don't it doesn't really matter that it's sent when encrypted but um, <coughs> anyway this is uh, one another place to store data that you should look into if you want to obtain all the data the application is storing uh, for Google Drive it's integrated into play services there there are uh, libraries for Google Drive so it's very easy to use uh, however it's in a so-called uh, up data uh, hidden folder so if you open uh, Google Drive the, um, the web UI to Google Drive you won't you won't see the, the actual data you might see the name of the application but not the, the data uh, lately there is also Firebase storage Dropbox of course the application might be pushing uh, stuff directly to Amazon S3 or using one of the Amazon libraries uh, it doesn't matter but um, this is another place to look for application data how to get it uh, many ways to do it you can capture the tokens if you're monitoring the traffic uh, you can extract the token from account manager DB if you have root access or you can pretend to be Google Play services and just obtain the token this is uh, oops. okay uh, this will give you a so-called master token that you can later exchange for Google Drive token or Android backup token or whatever and then you can just uh, get the data directly from the uh, from the APIs uh, there are some API limits you might want to watch out for because uh, it tries to limit uh, how, how many requests you can make but not very hard to obtain the data uh, so what types of data applications usually have 
of databases. Of course, uh, it's part of the Android OS. Uh, it's under databases. It's, it's usually SQLite. Uh, of course, as we uh, saw yesterday, you can have applications which use SQL Cipher. There is no such thing as SQLite Cipher. Sorry for the typo, but uh, you might have encrypted database. Uh, if you have an encrypted database, of course, you would need a key, which, as we saw, might be hard coded, might be uh, user, might be entered by the user on startup. Um, the DB browser for SQLite, actually, the recent version support SQL Cipher, so if you have the code, you can just use the same tool for uh, the raw database and the uh, encrypted database. Shared preferences, again, XML file, uh, XML files with different settings. By default, they are not encrypted. Some applications might use. Uh, uh, there's a number of libraries that let you obfuscate shared preferences. Uh, files, uh, different app specific format, usually under the files directory. Lately, uh, no SQL databases for Android has been uh, becoming popular. So if you're using some something like Realm DB or similar, the database files uh, would usually be under the files directory. Also, if you have any sort of hybrid application which uses web views, uh, there's a lot of data that's coming from web views. Uh, it's usually in cache or app web view directory. Uh, you would have uh, cookies, any downloaded images or on other files from the application. You might be especially interested in, in cookies because uh, sometimes as with uh, normal web applications, they might store some secrets or other uh, other user data. So uh, moving on to dynamic analysis, different different ways uh, to do dynamic testing. Uh, one is debugging. The Java debugger is a very powerful tool. You can not just look at uh, the code or the state. You can also modify, to, uh, modify code if you wanted to. Uh, of course, by default, most applications uh, in their release build are not, are not debuggable, so you cannot attach uh, the debugger by default. Again, if you um, unpack, change the debuggable flag to true and repack, you will be able to, to use the debugger. Uh, another option is to use an engineering or some sort of custom ROM. In previous versions, it was enough to set those properties. Uh, lately, uh, you actually need, need a debug build to, to, to enable this because the, I believe that they actually, if, if that, and compile out, compile out the code in, in production build. But uh, in any case, if you're using an engineering uh, ROM, you would be able to attach to pretty much any any application, irrespective of the uh, value of the debugger of flag. Um, you can do execution tracing with uh, JWP or the uh, DDMS. This is the DDMS screen. It's quite not very easy to understand, but it's really, really powerful. You can capture heap, you can uh, see uh, threads, you can do profiling, a lot of things with those few icons in there. Uh, if you have decompiled code, you don't have the uh, original source code, you can step through it with um, this uh, plugin for IntelliJ called SmallIdea, also JEP supports uh, this kind of debugging with uh, disassemble code. Uh, if you're interested more in native debugging, you can use uh, JDB or uh, from the NDK. This is, there's different versions of JDB floating around. Usually you wanna get the latest NDK version, otherwise you'll have a number of problems. Uh, Ida Pro, of course, if you have it, uh, useful. Uh, hooking is another way to do dynamic analysis. Uh, so what is hooking? Uh, allows you to change app behavior without repackaging. You can modify parameters. You can capture return values, which is especially useful if you have things like crypto keys uh, and whatnot. Uh, you can modify even the OS behavior. Uh, you can disable some uh, security features. Uh, you can disable integrity checks. 
pretty much anything. Uh, usually it requires root because uh, there is uh, some level of messing around with the core uh, OS code. Uh, for uh, Java, the two I think most popular are Expose and Frida. For native code, Frida also. Uh, you can also use Frida for both uh, Java and native. There is uh, a little bit older tool, ADBI, but co also quite powerful if you're hooking uh, native code. Uh, so Expose, Expose, uh, as I said, it's quite powerful, but it takes uh, sort of a very straightforward approach. It replaces the virtual machine with one that allows cooking. So it, of course, it not only uh, needs room, uh, you need to replace a core part of the Android OS, which might uh, have its own problems because some, some applications don't really work well with uh, exposed uh, modified Android. It's been getting better lately, but something to watch out for. Hooks are in Java inside a helper APK. So the big pain point of Expose that it requires restart. So if you do even a small change, you have to reapply restart, debug, restart, etc. Uh, but this is uh, useful uh, because it starts very early in the uh, application or uh, Android lifecycle. So you can hook stuff uh, before the application starts or as the OS is starting, which is uh, not easy to do with Frida. Uh, but currently, uh, Expose doesn't work on uh, Android 7. I think it's been worked on, but uh, not, not yet. So this is a small example how you do hooking. This is for, just trust me, it basically uh, you find the WebView client class, and then you replace the um, implementation of the on receive error method, which is a callback you get when you have some sort of um, SSL or certificate validation error, and you just basically replace it with a method that does nothing. And this di effectively disables any sort of uh, uh, certificate validation. Frida is a newer tool. Uh, it's uh, quite powerful. It works on iOS, Android, also Linux, Mac OS, I think maybe Windows too. Uh, so you can use very similar uh, techniques for both iOS and Android testing. Uh, latest version actually worked fairly well on 64-bit Android and Android 7. Uh, there is a Python API, and the actual hooking code is done in JavaScript. And a big uh, advantage of Frida is that uh, you can uh, update the hooks without restart. You can just push the new hook code and it will uh, update automatically. Uh, it needs an agent process on the device. So if you have root access, you have there is a service that you need to start. You don't have to modify the OS. You don't have to replace the VM. Just uh, push a single binary and start it. Uh, however, um, because of uh, this architecture, it's somewhat harder to hook things before startup. So if you want to uh, hook something that's like very early in the application startup, like the initialization code or some unpacking code that runs before anything else, it's somewhat harder to do it with Frida. Uh, they have a feature called spawn gating, which basically uh, places a stop on stops all Dalvik applications before starting. You get a callback before the application starts, and you have the option to hook something before you allow it to continue. Uh, hooking is similar to Exposed. Uh, as I said, it uses JavaScript, basically, and this is what you might do if you wanted to uh, capture the secret keys that are used by some uh, encryption routine. Uh, you would find the, the the class to hook to, uh, then you would hook uh, over write the encrypt method with code like this, which basically outputs the key sold and uh, and, uh, and the plain text data on your uh, on on your uh, desktop. You will get a callback with this data, so you can just uh, easily view it. A few words about games. Games are quite, quite different. 
They're usually they are not really Android applications. They run on Android, but they just have a single activity that uh, just starts whatever gaming uh, framework they're using. Uh, usually it's Unity 3D, which is .NET, so it's uh, mono implemented usually in C Sharp. Uh, Unity has the options, the so-called IL to CPP to convert the, the .NET code to uh, C++, which is then compiled and then of course converted to native code. Uh, Cocos 2DX is the other big one, C++, uh, also native code, so uh, <coughs> none of the usual techniques for reversing Java work there. Uh, the tools you might use are uh, ILSpy for uh, .NET, .NET Reflector, of course, Hopper, and IDEPRO for uh, native code. Uh, another interesting thing is for games, the threat model is very, very different. The attacker is usually the user. What they're trying to do is cheat. So they have physical access to the device. They can do hooking. They can capture traffic. They can do pretty much anything. So how to prevent this? Uh, there are uh, different, different uh, ways to cheat. You can replay packets. You can, let's say, modify a packet that sends the, your stamina to the server to make it infinite, you can speed up the game, slow up, slow down the game. Uh, you can change things on memory, again, same things like points or stamina are eventually stored in like an integer somewhere in memory, you can just search for it and replace it. Uh, there are actually tools that make this very easy. Uh, so how to defend against this? Usually the mitigation is just layers and layers of obfuscation and packing and then monitoring uh, on the server side for abusers and protocol obfuscation or custom encryption, etc., to make it harder to, to figure out what exactly the, uh, the game is doing. So a few words about common vulnerabilities. Uh, this is, as I said, not really exhaustive, uh, but those are the things that um, usually we see in, in most applications. Unsecured on Android components. This is uh, services, content providers, activities that are public, but they shouldn't be, or they don't have any permissions set. Uh, this will be flagged by most static analysis tools, which find this automatically. How to spot it manually is, of course, you would use for intent filters or export it equal to uh, any permissions which are not signature level are usually uh, useless uh, because anybody can get them. Of course, in late, uh, Android 6 Plus, you might uh, require uh, user interaction, but usually it's uh, just granted and install time, so it's the same with or without the permission. Um, you can access or start directly uh, components very uh, easily with the built-in AM command in the ADB shell. If you call this from a root shell, uh, you can ask bypass pre, uh, permissions. Uh, you can send the intents to private components, so you can easily uh, do stuff that the application doesn't expect, but it's very easy to just use the shell. Of course, there are some tools that provide uh, APIs for this, uh, so you can do automatically send intents and do some sort of parameter fuzzing and whatnot. Uh, insecure storage, this is a very interesting <laughs> vulnerability in Android because uh, you say that application is uh, saving credentials or uh, cryptographic keys or whatever without encryption and then how to handle it, you say encrypt it but there's really no good way to uh, do key management before Android 6.0 so that's why you end up with uh, uh, things as hard-coded keys or using the first four bytes of the IMEI <laughs> for a key or things like that. Of course, you have the uh, SD card, shared storage, which anybody can read with the, if they have the read access permission. On internal storage, uh, you have the world readable. Uh, it's been deprecated, and I think now even at compile time, you will get a warning or an error if you're using world readable files. Uh, but even if you store data in internal storage, which is sandbox, it can still be leaked. 
or at least export it outside of the device with things as such as automatic backup. Uh, this is a screen for the from the Google Drive application. It has a little, not hidden, but uh, uh, a little option to show you what backups, what applications have backups on Google Drive. So if you have some uh, private data that you're not uh, supposed or not allowed by uh, privacy laws and put to store on third party providers, you might want to check uh, because as I said, backup is enabled by default uh, on the latest, later uh, unpleased versions, it will, even if the user does nothing, uh, the, the data will be pushed to the uh, Google Drive backup storage. Uh, so how to check for this? Of course, you can obtain all the data and see what's in there. Uh, search and match for potentially sensitive data. Uh, obtain the Google backup directly and see, see what's in there. Also another way, but you have to sort of emulate the Google Play Services backup code to, to get the, the raw data. It's actually, I think, it's star format, so it's not very hard to extract once you have it. Uh, information leakage, uh, different ways to leak data on very 3.4.1, 3, I think. Uh, anybody can obtain the lock cut any application that can uh, extract, uh, uh, that can start shell scripts, can get the data. Uh, and one thing to watch out for is that not only your own code can leak data, any third party libraries you might be using, such as ad networks or analytics, some of them are overly aggressive. They try to send as much data as possible. So even if your code is okay and you trust your own developers, you should definitely check all libraries that you're integrating, like both at runtime to see what they're sending and maybe reverse engineer and see what they're trying to, to get. So usually they will do something. They will check for permissions. If the, if the application happens to have the, let's say, read phone state permission, they will try to get IMEI or the SIM card serial, bundle, uh, serial number, so as much data as possible. So uh, don't use those applications, uh, those libraries or services. Uh, again, for log cut, you can easily just dump the log cut for a, in a file and then use Dread or any other uh, automated tool to look for it. Uh, as I said, you check third party libraries. Also broadcast uh, system wide, sometimes applications, uh, they only want to communicate between components inside the application, but they, they use system wide broadcast, which might uh, expose uh, some sensitive data depending on what you're sending. Uh, a lot of static analysis tools will flag any, any use of the send broadcast API, but uh, if if you're using such a tool, you might uh, get <coughs> notified about it. If not, be wary of any uh, system-wide uh, uh, broadcast or other ports of IPC. Um, insecure communication, of course, uh, very common. Uh, sending stuff in playtext in HTTP, this is uh, still happens, although not so often. Uh, another often overlooked problem is not just sending, but getting data over HTTP. Uh, if you're downloading anything like, uh, like zip files or any other form of archive from HTTP, anyone who can, who can access the, the, the traffic can change it, of course. So you can inject stuff in there. Uh, they can uh, make the file decompress to 10 terabytes of data, even though it's like 10 kilobytes. Uh, path traversal, if you're extracting to external storage SD card, you can get files in weird places, even if you're extracting in internal, uh, internal the private uh, directory, you can, if there is some sort of path traversal, it might overwrite some, some critical file, let's say the preferences file, change the way application works, uh, how the application works. Uh, executable code, like Android allows to dynamically load uh, classes, deck files, it is, I think it is forbidden for in the Play Store, but it is it is doable with the API, so some some, uh, some applications do it. 
uh, also JavaScript in any sort of hybrid application that has web views and it's downloading uh, JavaScript via HTTP. HTTP is also potentially val uh, vulnerable. You might have homemade transport encryption uh, with, I don't know, uh, hard coded key or whatever. How to check for this? Uh, examine all traffic, as I said. Check the origin of all downloaded data. If it's coming from something like a CDN, it might be HTTP only because either the CDN doesn't support HTTP, uh, HTTPS or they charge more for HTTPS, so that's why uh, they use HTTP. Um, and of course, you should check the uh, local validation of any any file that is downloaded in use application. Broken SSL, it's super common, of course. No verification of server certificate or no host name verif uh, verification or uh, using broken or old cipher suits like this or Shaolin based or uh, using, if, if the application has some sort of uh, custom code using a vulnerable uh, old OpenSSL version or sometimes even the underlying OS might have a vulnerability, a known vulnerability in the SSL stack. So how to check for this? Again, perform any in the middle without installing the CA certificate. If you, before you install it, if you don't get any errors, there's definitely a problem there. Uh, once you have the source code or the smiley code, if you grab for hostname verifier or uh, X509 uh, trust manager, pretty much any any code that calls any of these API, it usually uh, has some vulnerability. They could be just implementing custom pinning and they might be doing it correctly, but more often than not, it's not correct and there is some sort of a problem. Uh, if they use uh, native libraries, if they have lib crypto, lib SSL, usually it could be all versions, so just check the version in there. Uh, if you have the native code, verify callback is what OpenSSL uses to check certificates. A lot of people overwrite it to do nothing, so uh, one thing to check for. Uh, there is a very powerful tool, no go to fail by Google, which lets you test for a lot of these things automatically, both on the, for the server side and the application side. It's somewhat uh, hard to, to get it to, to work, but it's useful. Uh, you can invest the time. Uh, the time. Uh, weak cryptography, uh, the usual uh, suspects there. You can have uh, hard-coded keys or homemade encryption with base 64 or X or uh, all algorithms. Weak uh, random number generation is this quite common actually. Uh, using Java util random to generate keys or other data or uh, random string utils is from Apache commands, but it generates random strings. Internally, it, usual, it uses util random, or if you set the seed, uh, seed the random generator from the time or something like that. Uh, insecure block modes, usually, uh, unfortunately, if you just do uh, the cipher get instance AES, you would get the ECB mode. Uh, so ECB mode, fixed IVs, CBC without HMAC, anything like that could be potentially a problem. Uh, hash instead of HMAC, also quite common problem, uh, vulnerable to length extension. Uh, homemade KDFs, key derivation with some sort of uh, very, I think it was quite common uh, before to use uh, uh, set C to set the state of secure random and then just use it to generate the key and the seed would be your password or something like this. I think this is deprecated now and in Android 7, I think they even removed this provider, but uh, it's still used in other code. Homemade crypto, again, key exchange based on uh, React protocols is also a uh, suspect. So how to check for this? Grep is the most powerful tool you can use for this. If you have the Smiley code or the Java code, if you just grab for Java X crypto, it will flag most usages of uh, cryptography in the application. It's usually something weird going in there. Uh, XO5 is anything, any code that uh, is doing something with certificates, also potentially suspect. If you have the native code, grab for SSL APIs. 
uh, anything that looks like base64 uh, it should be decoded uh, sometimes of course it's encrypted in then base64 sometimes it's just uh, obfuscated so a lot of hard-coded data you can just um, plug it by simply the, uh, decoding base64 um, if you're doing any sort of uh, dynamic analysis lo looking for uh, through the traffic uh, you can just uh, get a lot of session IDs or a lot of tokens and look for repetition or pattern there. If you have, let's say, a login token and between two or three tokens only a couple of bytes and the ends are changing, then it's a very good indication that you, they're using something like uh, ECB mode encryption and maybe they have the validity time at the end. So very uh, easy to, um, to exploit. Uh, broken authentication session manager this is the same as for uh, web applications basically short repeated easy to guessable session IDs insufficient authorization very common problem uh, lots of lots of checks when you log in but then when you directly access an object by their ID sometimes they check for authentication tokens sometimes they don't so very uh, common problem uh, you can Easily spoke this with Perm. Uh, it has a replay tool which lets you uh, capture a request, change something, and replay. So if you just remove all cookies and tokens and send the send the request, uh, usually, uh, or modify the tokens and all cookies, uh, it will um, easily spot if there's any problems with session or authorization. Uh, of course, if you have a more complex protocol or something that doesn't uh, easily fit in in Burp or similar uh, tool, you can use alternative clients with Python, Ruby, or your uh, language of choice and uh, send something that uh, API doesn't doesn't uh, expect. Uh, yeah, call out of order, send the unexpected data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, insecure reviews very common in. Uh, hybrid applications. Uh, usually nowadays, pretty much every application has some sort of built-in browser. Like click on a link on Twitter, or uh, it Messenger, I think maybe, uh, Facebook Messenger, it won't open the, the browser, it would open the internal, internal, internal browser. It's usually web view based. Uh, Sometimes the functionality is extended with JavaScript interfaces, which allows JavaScript to uh, uh, call exported methods in the web view, which in turn call native APIs. Uh, SSL errors with uh, SSL error handler proceed. If you see this anywhere, it's a usually a good indication that they are ignoring SSL errors. Uh, we had a recent, I think, publication about uh, password managers in Android. And one of the problem was uh, they used some sort of web view which allowed access to local files with some uh, combined with other vulnerabilities you could extract internal files. So if you have web views, uh, uh, by default I think, they have some access to local files. Uh, so it's something to watch for. Uh, custom URL schemes are also something that's used to extend the application and make it work uh, based on links or other uh, data that you get from the web. Uh, if there's insufficient validation, you might be able to call uh, native code inside the application or even uh, execute. Uh, so again, uh, Burp is your friend here, uh, very similar to um, uh, testing web applications. Yeah, you can also do remote debugging of web views in, in Chrome. So you can uh, see what the JavaScript is doing or modify state in there. Uh, again, grep, if you see any of these called inside the application, it's usually a problem. Uh, this is uh, override URL loading is usually has to do something with custom schemes, uh, allow file access uh, or setting cookies or receive SSL error if they override this, uh, might be you know, ignoring uh, SSL errors. Uh, something uh, specific to Android, uh, lacking FOS bug mitigations. If you have to target old Android versions, 
you have to live with the problems in there. Uh, so one very famous uh, problem is CPU random. It has some problems uh, in Android 4.1 and 2, I think. Uh, there's blog posts about it, how to deal with it. HTTPS UR collection, it would try to be helpful and reconnect with SSL version 3 if you get an error in some versions of Android, which of course has uh, implications that if the, uh, there are a number of vulnerabilities with SSL v3, so if you want to make sure that it's disabled, it's not so easy to do, unfortunately. You have to make a, a custom uh, SSL socket factory, which removes the version 3 SSL. If you have vulnerable open SSL, uh, it's fairly easy to um, to fix by using the GMS provider. If you are uh, on the Play Store, uh, GMS provider with, uh, will load the latest uh, latest open SSL version, and you install a provider which does open SSL, uh, does SSL before the system one. So it basically it overwrites the system provider with a newer version without having to update the whole OS. Uh, lack of code protection, if you care about your application being modified or repackaged, not everybody does this, uh, most games do. Uh, so uh, it, you should have at least some for sort of obfuscation for DEX files. Uh, temper detection, usually it's done by checking the hash of the signing certificate or the hash of classic DEX. And it's fairly easy to check if you recommend uh, change and repackage and it runs without problems usually means that there is no code protection. Uh, sec OS security integrity check. Um, of course, uh, there's lots of uh, security features that application might be using, but you, if you can uh, not trust the OS, it's kind of uh, meaningless. As we said, you can do hooking and you can uh, disable system-wide uh, certificate verification and whatnot if you have root access. So some applications, uh, especially if, if they're dealing with any sort of sensitive personal, financial, et cetera, data, they would uh, check to see that the application, uh, the OS they're running on is trustworthy. A uh, usual way to do this is so-called root detection. Uh, most applications, they will just check for the sub-binary or the super sub package, or in some cases, they will even scan can for uh, SQD binaries, uh, but this is usually not sufficient. Uh, there are many other ways to compromise the security level of the OS. Uh, anything that is signed with test keys or if there is uh, device admin applications installed or uh, any number of uncert unknown certificates in the user trust or VM, Verity, and SE Linux, if any of those are disabled, usually a good indication that uh, OS integrity is being compromised. Core properties, as we saw, uh, debuggable, etc. If those are uh, modified from the defaults, also might be an indicator that you're running on um, untrustworthy OS. Uh, also, uh, you can have an OS-wide proxy installed for some sort of VPN that runs by default. It could be also suspect. So, um, if you want to make sure that the OS is trustworthy, you should check for at least those. Google Safety Net does this for you. Uh, it's regularly updated, so you should definitely uh, consider using it. Like this is an example, Android Pay. It won't work if uh, if the bootloader is unlocked. In this case, uh, so um, root detection usually uh, not enough. Uh, you need to check for a lot more things if you really want to make sure that the OS is trustworthy. So just use uh, Safety Net. And I think that's all. There's no final slide, but basically, even if you trust your all developers, you should verify, do some sort of uh, checking before release. A uh, whole bunch of tools in no particular order that could be useful. Uh, also, some resources. Uh, OHAS Mobile has some. Uh, new documentation still work in progress, but it has some detailed, quite uh, detailed information about uh, testing, a number of guides for secure development, 
recently released is the Smartphone Secure Development Guidelines, the one in the in the bottom. So, if you're interested more in uh, testing on real applications, you should definitely check those. I don't know if we have time for questions, but it's all. We do have time for questions as the, the next item on the agenda is uh, the coffee break. So if there are questions now, then please feel free to. Yeah, they're at the back of the room. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. And uh, um, can you suggest um, and um, a custom ROM uh, that allows to debug uh, all its applications? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I think CyanogenMon, which is now <laughs> that uh, allows this by default. I think also the newer like Lineage OS, uh, it is, I think it is configurable in, in uh, developer settings. If not, you can just, uh, just Change the um, change the properties when before you compile the the uh, the ROM. But I think uh, it is uh, configurable in developer options in in Lineage OS at least. Uh, a question: What uh, obfuscation tools or technique uh, have you checked, and uh, is there uh, any that could stop you or, or only slow you down? Well, uh, I haven't done much research. Some of my colleagues have, but usually it doesn't take too long because even if there is some sort of packing uh, or obfuscation, at some point it's loaded in memory. So either you dump it directly from memory and then repackage it, or uh, sometimes they do something, some tricks with the ELF header, like they replace or remove the bytes in there, make it harder to load in. Uh, in other tools, but uh, the idea usually is to, to slow you down, or at least to make sure that the off-the-shelf tools that don't work as is. So, for example, in line we have a number of custom, like in-house packing and obfuscation tools. So, any game before release, you can just upload it somewhere, and it will uh, package the the source code. Yes, hi. Um, so Android 6, I think, introduced the application uh, cloud backups that are transparent to the application for the application data. Mm -hmm. uh, have you looked how those things are encrypted, like on the cloud? So that, that's the first part. And the second part, do you know if uh, the things in the key store also get backed up automatically? Mm, I don't think it's encrypted. It's only graphic encryption. So over SSL, but actual data, I don't think it's encrypted, but I'm not 100% sure. But I think, like, I did some testing with Android 6 for this, and I don't think it is encrypted. Not 100% not sure, but I think it's, it's plain text. All right. Hi. Uh, I just had, like, a kind of random question. What kind of devices do you keep around, or how many of them do you keep around? Uh, so what do you mean? Like oh. phones, I would imagine like you have one for custom rooms and then your own personal device. Well, uh, usually you want to test on a range of devices, I guess, but it makes sense to use not the latest version, like a little older, maybe Android 6 or Android 5, because of any sort of tools, they support it better, and it usually it has a wider market share anyway. So. Maybe one version behind the latest is a good, uh, good starting point for most testing. Hello. Uh, do you know how this safety net compares to other uh, commercial available solutions like Promon Shield or other Shield uh, mm, solutions? Uh, really? I mean, there f some people have looked into safety net, and I had some. Uh, At least checks those things. 
but it's a work in progress. It's continuously updated, so uh, it's a moving target. I mean, safety net it gets updated all the time. And of course, uh, safety net, it's not the device part. It's cloud part also, which is backed by Google's infinite database of malware and whatnot. So uh, this is something that's not easy to compare. Maybe like, maybe you say this commercial uh, whatever solution, it checks the same thing on the device, sends the same data on the back end, but I think we're pretty sure that Google has the largest <laughs> database of devices and malware. So uh, unless you have like uh, any specific reason, like uh, you're running on, I don't know, uh, Android App Store, so there's no Google Play services or some other third party market, it's a good idea, I think, to use just use safety net, so. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, can you explain or give some hints how the certificate pinning is implemented in Android 7.0 NAP? Uh, there is a talk about it later. <laughs> I think we should uh, uh, listen to that. But basically, uh, the XML config, it uses uh, the hashes in there and then checks the certificates for if they match those hashes, essentially. So uh, it's not fundamentally different from what you would do in your application. It's just easier to do and it's implemented properly, <laughs> I guess, this is a tweak. Uh, there's many ways to get pinning wrong. As I, I showed, there is some applications they just uh, check the DN if it says GeoTrust or SSL V3, uh, whatever major CA they consider it trustworthy. There are more subtle ways to get it wrong. And, and uh, the trouble with pinning is that if you get it wrong, you can get hard crushes. I mean, if at some point it works and then the next day it doesn't and you have 10 million users cannot connect because you messed up your pinning code. So if you like recommending developers to do pinning, you should be like really careful, <laughs> careful because it has a very, very wide reaching impact. So it's, it's a good thing to have, but should be used with, with care. And thanks again for your talk.